Welcome to Android Dialogues, where we have bite-sized conversations with people in the Android community. I'm Huynh Nguyen Dao, and I'm speaking with... Kevin Most. And we're currently in San Francisco for Kotlin Conf 2017. Yeah! Uh, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us today. Where are you based, and how did you get started in Android? Uh, I'm based in New York. I got my start in Android at a smaller company, uh, like a loyalty card program company. I was doing back-end stuff there. Uh, right out of school and I expressed an interest in doing Android. Uh, I loved the, plat the platform for like, you know, many, many years. So mm -hmm. I was like, I want to try this out uh, as a developer. And I tried it and it was great. And I've been doing it for the last three years or so. And it's great. Nice. And now we're at Kotlin Conf. So unsur unsurprisingly, uh, we're going to talk about Kotlin today. So Kevin, what is your talk actually at Kotlin Conf? Yeah. So my talk title is Idiomatic Interop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the interop story between Java and Kotlin and like some of the pain points and what you can do to alleviate them and make your interop story perfect. Because I think a lot of us have like mixed Java Kotlin code bases. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It feels like actually that was probably one of the things that made Kotlin kind of, I guess, take off is that is that interoperability that we can kind of keep all of our current code and slowly integrate Kotlin with it. Can you talk about maybe some of your pain points that you came across when you were uh, kind of uh, mixing Java and Kotlin code? Yeah, so totally. I think like the interop story is very good right now. And the fact that it's very good, I think, is one of the reasons why Kotlin's taking off. Like there have been alt JVM languages before and they yeah. haven't really taken off on Android because the interop story is so painful. But like Kotlin is like 99% of the way there probably, and you just have to sort of fill in the gaps. And it's really not that it's not there, but you just have to be cognizant as you're developing new code in Java and think about how it'll look in Kotlin and new code in Kotlin and think about how it'll look in Java. Like if you're writing Kotlin code that has like inlining, it won't have inlining in Java. Mm. Uh, and of course, I think the biggest thing is like uh, when you write Java code, it's not null aware and then you get platform types in Kotlin and you sort of have to try to alleviate uh, the pain points of working with that. You know, you can still get the NPEs. Can you kind of explain really quickly what platform types are? Yeah, so when you call into a Java method and it doesn't have any information about its type, uh, you'll frequently you'll call it and you'll see IntelliJ will uh, show in the autocomplete that it's of type like string exclamation point. It's not just string and it's not string question mark. And that means that it can't, the compiler can't infer the type of that, well the nullability type of mm -hmm. that uh, variable that it's returning, of that return type. So it either, it could be null, it could not be null. So uh, for the sake of uh, making the interrupt story more convenient, uh, Kotlin treats it as non-null essentially for the sake of you can dereference it without making safe calls to it, but it could actually be holding a null value. So you as the developer have to be cognizant of that and uh, make sure you check everything that comes through and make sure it's not null. When I convert, say, a uh, Java file to Kotlin, I get those that, that null assertion, all those like the bang bangs everywhere. Yeah, usually it'll put those there uh, when you're converting. Uh, so that if it blow if it if it's null, uh, it'll blow up early, right? Mm -hmm. So that when you right. do the bang bang, it blows up immediately, and then you're not blowing up downstream with that variable that's actually null. Mm -hmm. okay. There's basically things that you do on both ends uh, on the Kotlin side when you're writing Kotlin code that uh, is called from Java, and uh, I guess the inverse or converse. I never remember the difference between those two, um, but the reverse where you're writing Java code. Sorry, wait writing Kotlin code that's called from Java and Java that is called from Kotlin, that, that um, it sounds like there's ways that you can kind of clean things up and make it easier and less painful for you. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Um, can you give examples of both sides of it? Yeah, totally. And that's, I get so tongue twisted when I give this talk. I'm like, Java from Kotlin, Kotlin from Java. I, I I'm just like, what, am I, just now. what am I actually saying? Yeah. Like, what <laughs> yeah. side am I on? I forget. <laughs> yeah. So when you're calling from Java to Kotlin, I think one of the biggest uh, like low-hanging fruits is all of the at JVM annotations. So you can annotate your Java methods with them. There's a whole set of them. There's JVM overloads, JVM static, JVM wildcards, JVM suppress wildcards, JVM. I don't... Let's, all the JVMs. There's a lot of JVMs. <laughs> I would recommend just going into IntelliJ, opening a Java file, typing at JVM, and just hitting Oh, that's a great idea. I like that. Yeah. Control space and see what pops up. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really interesting ones. But uh, they are basically annotations that tell the Kotlin compiler what to do with this Java code when it brings it over. Or, sorry, actually. <laughs> I got time. Yeah, yeah. Wait, Kotlin to Java. Yeah, what to do with the Kotlin code when it go, when it writes? See, I did it again. What to do with the Kotlin code uh, when writing when reading it from Java when exporting it over to Java right. essentially. Mm -hmm. So you annotate a Kotlin method with these JVM annotations, like you annotate it with JVM overloads, for example, mm -hmm. and then it'll generate uh, overloaded versions for all of your default parameters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you write JVM static, it'll generate a static method that delegates through to that method that's not static because Kotlin doesn't actually have statics. Mm -hmm. So wait, I don't have to have that really ugly companion 
syntax when I'm calling a companion object methods from yeah. Java, and so I don't have to do some class dot companion dot blah 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 yeah, blah. Yeah, if you have like user dot create or whatever, you don't have to do user dot companion dot create. You could do like user dot create now because the static method actually gets exported into the right code. When can you get get into kind of some uglier syntax when you're calling Java from Kotlin? When you're calling Java from Kotlin, yeah. Uh, if you have like super nested generics, you will get, and you have like um, collections in there, you're gonna get like parentheses mutable list of parentheses oh, mutable yeah. list of string exclamation point exclamation point exclamation point, <laughs> and you're just gonna look at it and go like, what am I actually reading here? Yeah, Where, and the, the, the actual... code's like off the screen maybe yeah. at some point. Yeah, you're like, what's the useful information here? And in that case, it's just like a list of a list of a string, but there's so much <laughs> stuff nested in there that you have to like pick apart. Mm -hmm. um, so like. Uh, Platform types are definitely, I think, the biggest uh, pain point when calling into Java. Mm -hmm. There aren't so many other uh, pain points just because Kotlin mostly has a superset of Java features, I would say. Mm -hmm. The pain points come more when you call into Kotlin from Java. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain things you just can't call into or there are certain things that um, you know, you'll do and it'll seem fine and then it won't actually be fine. Like for example, uh, one thing is like if you have an interface and you have like an abstract method on it. Yeah. And that method, uh, you as a Kotlin, you as the person writing that Kotlin interface want it to throw some exception when mm -hmm. something happens. Right. But if it's a checked exception and you go to implement it in Java somewhere, let's say you're a Kotlin library developer and your Java consumers go to implement it mm -hmm. and they go to throw IO exception, it's gonna say you can't throw that and then you go to add it to your method header so that you can throw it and then it says you can't, that's not an override anymore. Oh so, no. So it oh, totally yeah. breaks and you have to remember to, there's a throws annotation and you have to remember to annotate that. Right, like yeah. right. I actually just ran across that recently while getting the code ready for my talk. So kind of going back, you said that you felt like you, we were 99% there in terms of interop, but there's 1% where you had to fill in the gaps. But uh, I actually learned about, um, or actually rather we were talking about something where it's not just about us maybe filling in the gaps, but actually asking or kind of uh, working with JetBrains to fill in those gaps. And uh, we were talking about keep. Yeah. Keep. Can you tell us what Keep is? <laughs> so uh, it's a, it's a, it's hosted as a GitHub repository, and you can submit pull requests to it, and you basically define a spec for a new feature uh, that you want in Kotlin. So it's a way for uh, normal people like us who are not part of like the JetBrains team to actually be a part of the evolution of the language. Um, many Keeps have gone on to actually be implemented, uh, like bound callable references came out of Keep. Uh, sliding windows, which is going to be in, I think, 1.2 uh, partitioning lists came mm -hmm. in in a keep. Uh, oh, there's cool. a keep right now that's pretty interesting for higher order types. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, like, so there's no real, like, I guess, um, bar for keeps that can be kind of like simple, kind of syntactic, yeah. nice things, or kind of higher level, kind of like more, much more structural things in the language. Yeah. It's, of course, easier to get like a, a small thing in and with like a minor release, but a big thing will usually, you know, it'll take, if, if they decide to take it on, it'll take like one or two uh, cycles. And they don't, of course, necessarily take on everything. I think one of the nicest parts of Kotlin is still that it's uh, simple and uh, easy to understand and doesn't have a lot of hidden uh, features that come back to bite you. On the Keep uh, GitHub page, they even encourage people that maybe only have like a vague notion of what they want to join the um, official Kotlin Slack and kind of hash it out. And that's, yeah. I think that's really cool. I think that's also another thing that makes Kotlin very compelling is that I, I feel like, you know, Java, I don't, you know, Java is a great language, um, but it feels like this monolithic thing that, you know, you know, like, as you said, like maybe us mere mortals can only like look at afar <laughs> and hope one day that certain things change or yeah. that new features or, or just new um, capabilities are added. But Kotlin feels like we're actually having a conversation with JetBrains. Yeah, you can get on the Kotlin Slack and there are some great channels. There's language proposals, there's standard library. Uh, and if you want to go even further and actually start working on Kotlin itself uh, and contribute some code, there's a contributors channel with a a K, K, K <laughs> contributors, and it's uh, it's where you can go to get started uh, to like clone the Kotlin repo and actually make a change in it, like make a compiler change, uh, make a compiler plugin, things like that. That is incredibly cool. Um, have you tried yourself kind of writing any proposals, or do you have any in mind yet? Or uh, let's see, uh, there was a there there is something I would like. Um, it came in a um, in the Kotlin language features survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it sounds great, and it's something that I've wanted actually since before that, but 
Uh, one thing was uh, static analysis functions, uh, static analysis annotations like uh, at pure. So it would be nice to put at pure onto a lambda and say like this lambda can't modify any state, right? It can't have any access to external state. Um, so it's a pure lambda and it just performs operations on its arguments and returns value. Oh, that would yeah. be really cool. I love that idea. Yeah. And, um, and of course, um, with Kotlin, you can suggest things like this. Um, well, thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, if people wanted to find you on the internet, how can they do that? Uh, my GitHub is probably the best place to find me. I'm just, uh, github.com slash Kevin Most. And I believe all the talks at KotlinConf will be uh, recorded. So if you are kind of curious about how to make your, okay, we're gonna get this straight. How to cleanly, how to write Java code that can cleanly be called from Kotlin and write Kotlin code, wait, Kotlin code that can be cleanly called from Java. There we go. We yep. should, you should definitely check out Kevin's talk when it comes out. And uh, well, thank you so much, Kevin, again. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. And thank you all. And we'll see you next time. Bye.